Good evening. Welcome. My name is Drew Johnston, and I'm Vice Chairman of the Great Decisions Committee and a board member of the West Michigan World Affairs Council. Welcome to the lead program of our yearly Great Decisions Foreign Policy Discussion Series, our largest and most prestigious series. How many of you are current members of the World Affairs Council? Let me see your hands. Oh, wow. Fantastic. <clears throat> how, many, how many of you are students? Uh, equal. All right. <laughs> Great. Love it. And if you're not a World Affairs Council member, welcome. And here's our pitch. You may join for as little as $5, $10 a year. <clears throat> and with our email membership, the membership desk is open after the program, and it's only $5. <clears throat> Okay, um, we're also selling the Great Decisions textbook in the lobby, only $20 when you, when you leave this evening. These present a balanced and succinct synopsis of all the topics along with great bibliographies. <clears throat> now to our evening speaker. We know many of you are <coughs> here this evening because you heard Deaner Temple Raston last year as she was our lead speaker for our Great Decisions 2013. Our committee, because she was such an audience favorite, asked her to come back this year. You are now, <clears throat> you are in for a most unusual program. Dina, for the past six months, has been a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University doing original research on big data. Please help me welcome Dina Temple Raston and her presentation on the role of the press and national security leaks in the age of big data. Thanks very much. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Uh, can you hear me okay? Thanks for coming this evening. Um, so I thought I would tell you just a little bit about what it is I'm doing at the Neiman. And I should also tell you that um, you are experiencing only my second PowerPoint presentation ever. Because I'm a national public radio person, I always think everything in audio, and that you should just be mesmerized by my words and not pictures. And um, then I went to Harvard for six months, and every Harvard professor gives a PowerPoint presentation. So I wanted to see how much work they actually put into their lectures. And I found that making the slides is not that hard, but it's like toying with the transitions and deciding on the right picture actually takes a really long time. So if I uh, slightly skip on slides, I apologize in advance, because it's the first time I've actually, they've given me a remote on my own. I usually have someone touch it for me. So I'm at Harvard as a Neiman Fellow. And a Neiman Fellow is basically someone who uh, is a journalist, they pick 12 domestic journalists and 12 international journalists to study for one year at Harvard and looking at a, uh, to look at a particular research subject. Now some people actually, uh, you take classes at Harvard and at uh, Tufts and at MIT, uh, anything you want in any uh, discipline you want, uh, whether it has to do with your research project or not. Now I'm a little type A, those of you who saw me last year uh, probably can attest to that. And because I'm a little type A, I'm taking classes that no one in their right mind would take, like computer programming. And uh, I'm working with a particular professor whose name is Gary King, who runs the Institute for Qualitative Social Science, which basically is like a big data institute. And I met him on a story, you'll hear from him uh, later in this presentation. I met him on a story about three years ago when it suddenly seemed to me that the world of intelligence was changing. And the way it was changing is that it was using vast amounts of intelligence to try and find patterns to find terrorists or to uh, predict political upheaval. Now, that I'm, the fact that I'm studying big data and intelligence at Harvard now makes me look like an also-ran, but that's because Snowden went and uh, released everything seven months ago, and I actually applied a year and a half ago. So a year and a half ago, I was prescient, and now I'm late. So that's part of the problem. Um, so my first experience, okay, this is going well, the slide changed, excellent. Um, my first experience with big data and reporting were the Guantanamo files in 2011. You remember that uh, when the WikiLeaks stuff came out, there were three sort of tranches of information. The first was that, uh, that videotape you saw of an attack by an Apache helicopter in Iraq. 
The second were all those State Department cables that gave an idea of what exactly uh, the State Department thought of particular leaders and what the U.S. was doing in those countries with their counselor corps. And then the third tranche was a little bit less dramatic, which was these Guantanamo files. And I was covering Guantanamo for NPR at the time, and uh, Tom Jelton, who I know has been here uh, for speeches as well, he and I worked together on these Guantanamo files. And I had never worked with huge data files before. And I had no idea what we were supposed to do with these files. There were tens of thousands of pages. We had two weeks to basically go through them, decide what we were going to do, and uh, write those stories and have them ready for air. And uh, so I decided that the best way to search through these files, they were up on a cloud, was to just hope that something was in it, put in that search term, and maybe something would pop up. I later found out that Tom Jelton had the exact same strategy. We just didn't tell each other. So uh, at the time, Libya was falling, and we were in the process of falling. Gaddafi hadn't been killed yet. And so I thought, wow, you know, a great thing to be in here is anything about Libya. So I'll type in Libya, so L-I-B, L. Search. Sure enough, two prisoners, one was still in Guantanamo, and one uh, was no longer in Guantanamo, a guy named uh, Sufen bin Kumu, popped up in these files. And that's one of the stories that we wrote. It was literally total luck. I have this haystack. How do I find a needle? I'll take a wild guess and take a stab at it. It was actually a really cool story. And Kumu has come up again because there is some question as to whether or not this man had something to do with the attack on the Benghazi consulate. So a guy who's released from Guantanamo might have had something to do with the attack on the consulate. Now, the, the Guantanamo files are important because they're a really good starting point from which to look at just how much the world of secrets and the world of information has changed. WikiLeaks became a force when it did uh, because it came at a, of age at a time when the world is at a tipping point on two fronts. The first is there's a revolution in data. We all know about that. That's the way it's generated, the way it's received, the way it's downloaded, the way it's stored. As I was discussing, the way it's searched. That's all new. And second, there was a post-9-11 shift in the intelligence community. Right? Do you remember that the 9-11 Commission said that people weren't sharing information widely enough? And as a result, information was pushed out much further than it normally would have been. And because of that, a young man named Bradley Manning, who was an analyst in Iraq, was able to download all these files on a CD that he had marked Lady Gaga, and he gave it to WikiLeaks. So these two things have completely changed not only how I do my job, but how the intelligence community perceives what they should be doing. Which naturally brings us to this man, uh, Edward Snowden. Now, one of the things that I found very curious when the Snowden documents were first released uh, was how they were able to link Snowden documents to specific events that were about to happen. Remember, there was documents about how the US was spying on China. This was just before it was released just before President Obama went to China to meet the Chinese president. You'll recall that just before the G20 meeting, there was uh, a release about how the UK's sort of equivalent of uh, the NSA was in fact eavesdropping on conversations at a previous G20 meeting. And the way they made these documents relevant was that they would keep pegging them to news events. And I thought this was remarkable. So I've talked to people who have worked with the Snowden documents. And what I found out is that they're doing the exact same thing that we did with the Guantanamo files in 2011. They won't tell me how the documents are stored, whether it's in a cloud or on a, on a thumb drive or whatever it is, because they don't want the, the intelligence community to know what they're working with and possibly hack into it. But they did tell me that they basically, since they have so many documents, they basically just tap in a search term, hoping there's a document on it, and the documents pop up. So exactly what I did with Guantanamo files, that's what they're doing with Snowden. So now you know it's not that they're holding stuff back. They just sort of have a failure of imagination for what they have put out so far. This really has to do with what the news event is, and they try and find documents that will put Snowden on the front page every time because it's linked to a current event. So I thought I'd just really quickly go through 
what we've learned from the Snowden documents, because it's been drip, 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 and I think it's, it's hard for me to keep track of it at Harvard. I think if I was uh, still at NPR, I would be able to rattle these off off the top of my head. But because I don't do this on a daily basis, I actually had to go and look up and try and remember everything that has been released. So very briefly, they were, there are millions of Verizon phone records that are accessed daily by the NSA. Accessed is an important word, not analyzed, but accessed. Um, the prison program, you recall, that was the gathering of emails and other uh, metadata. There's computer hacking that they're doing. They actually have a special team of people who uh, learn how to hack into not just uh, foreign uh, databases, but also potentially things that we do here like uh, Yahoo and Google and other things like that. There's cell phone location data, which basically means if you turn on your phone, they know where you are if they're watching you. What's really interesting is what else they do is that if you turn off your phone and your phone goes on again in a different place, or a different phone goes on in a different place and calls the same number, they can track that. It's actually pretty important. If you think about it, that's the way, uh, that was a key piece of information in tracking down Osama bin Laden. You remember the courier cell phone would go off two hours before he went into Abbottabad. And they knew that this courier was somehow important in Al-Qaeda, but they weren't quite sure how. And the fact that he was uh, having so much security made them think, okay, maybe some of our suppositions about Osama bin Laden there are true. And then there's online game user data. So uh, uh, World of Warcraft, I am not a player. How many World of Warcraft players here? Excellent, okay, none of you. Oh, yeah, oh, good. Thank you, sir. <laughs> They're watching you. Um, <laughs> so it sounds sort of ridiculous that they were on World of Warcraft, but in fact, uh, World of Warcraft, uh, they were concerned that there was actually communication going on between uh, possible terrorists in the guise of playing World of Warcraft. And it sounds ridiculous, except that Al-Qaeda has been known to actually take instructions for its operatives and bury it in the pixels of pornographic material on the web. So this, I know uh, this was on the front page, I think, of the New York Times about how ridiculous it was that they were on these video game sites. But in fact, there was some precedent, which didn't really show up in the story. And finally, uh, there were text messages that they have been collecting in something called the Dish Fire program. I think that's the latest thing we've heard. No, the latest thing we've heard, bank and credit cards. Sorry, there was one more. About 70 banks around the world, they've been collecting the transaction data in those uh, various programs. So this is where I've been living for six months. It looks as cold as here, and I wanted you to know that I've been having a bad winter too. And while I've been, um, <laughs> except it seems colder there. I'm from California, so this was very cold for me. Um, and so what I'm doing uh, at the Neiman is basically taking a look at how this intersection of big data and intelligence is going to work in the future. If you want to try and find a terrorist, will vast amounts of information make that job easier? Or will vast amounts of information make that job harder by giving you lots and lots of false positives? I've been taking a lot of classes on the internet and privacy while I've been at, uh, at Harvard. And uh, it's really quite remarkable what you can get now just on regular open source information. For example, I don't know if you know this, did you know that the first three numbers, if you were born after 1989, it's very easy for me to figure out what your social security number is. That's because starting in 1989, uh, as soon as you were born, you were assigned a social security number. I know it's hard to believe, but I was born before 1989. And uh, my social security number, I got it when I was 13 years old. Which means the sequence of numbers is very hard to figure out. Because if you don't know the month of my birth date, et cetera, et cetera, you can't figure out my entire social security number. So the first, I, I, I got my first job at Hopton's Hot Fudge Factory uh, when I was 13 years old. So the first three numbers of my, and that's in California, so the first three numbers of my social security number, don't worry, I won't go too far, is 561. The two numbers after that have to do with my birth date, 
And the four numbers after that have to do with the sequence in which I actually applied for my card. So if you were born in 1989, and on Facebook you put your birth date, someone quite easily could figure out, if they know where you're born, what your full Social Security number is. And it's kind of remarkable that the Social Security Administration is doing it in this rote way. Now, I'd love to tell you I knew this for a long, long time, but I didn't. I learned it in a class last semester by a woman named uh, Latanya Sweeney, who's an expert in privacy, and I recommend she has got the privacy, datapricylab.com. I really recommend that you look at her website. Uh, there's some amazing experiments to see how much privacy you're actually giving up without even really realizing it. So this was a problem long before we saw what was going on with the NSA. So I've been working on these sort of privacy issues and on uh, terrorism and big data for a while. And back in uh, 2011, I did a story about Google Trends. Now some of you, I think last year, I talked about this a little bit, this particular story. And what this story is about is the fact that you can take what people are looking at uh, in their Google searches and have some idea of what's animating a population. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little bit of this piece because Linda Wertheimer has a much better radio voice than I do, and she'll sort of explain it to you. Intelligence agencies have traditionally relied on top secret information to track changes in other countries, but that did not help them predict the revolutions that have swept across the Arab world this year. In hindsight, it appears they could have found hints of what was going to happen in open sources online, in newspapers and broadcasts. With that in mind, researchers are looking for new ways to recognize change within societies. NPR's Dina Temple Raston explains. Okay. So basically what that story was about was about these researchers at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point who wanted to see if there was a way by looking at Google Trends, uh, Google Trends and Google searches whether or not you could have predicted uh, the fall of Mubarak in Egypt. And why this was interesting was because uh, they actually could. Do you remember when swine flu uh, was sort of this epidemic all over the country and Google started uh, Google flu trends? And what it did is apparently many people who were starting to feel feverish and nauseous would actually tap into Google and try to see whether or not they had flu symptoms. And as a result, Google was able to track where the next outbreaks of flu would be. And they did it better than the uh, Centers for Disease Control could do it. In fact, they were usually about a week ahead of the CDC, which is really quite amazing. So imagine if you could use the exact same thing to try and determine what's going on in a particular country, a country like Egypt. So these researchers at Combating Terrorism Center, what they did is they took a look at what Egyptians were searching for in the weeks running up to the Arab Spring. And it turns out that even more than searching for the Egyptian Brad Pitt, which would be the number one search normally, I'm not sure who that guy is, by the way, um, rather than searching for him, they were putting in the search word Tunis. And the reason why this is really interesting is because, if you recall, the uh, Arab Spring started when a young vegetable vendor who was uh, upset about corruption, someone stole his, uh, a police woman actually, stole his, uh, his scale, set himself alight. And he became a cause celebre in Tunis, and then it spread, as you know, across the Arab Spring. So it's very important to know, if you're in the intelligence business, or in the risk management business, to know that people all over Egypt were more interested in what was going on in Tunis than the Brad Pitt of Egypt. And the question is whether or not the intelligence community would have been able to predict what happened in Egypt if they had thought to use something like Google Trends. That instead of uh, sort of working with bad, uh, listening to bad guys, which is what they do, if they just tried to monitor and get an idea of what was animating the uh, population. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead here because I'm apparently talking really long. So, um, so let's talk about the FISA court order. The FISA court order that uh, started the Snowden document seven uh, months ago 
was basically an order that said that uh, Verizon was permitted to grab all the business records. I mean, sorry, the NSA was allowed to, uh, to grab all these Verizon business records for three months. What they released, what the Guardian released and uh, Glenn Greenwald released was five pages. Here's why I have a little bit of problem with the story and the way it's been unfolding. What you may not have known is that under those five pages were 85 other pages. And those 85 other pages were classified, and what they talked about was minimization. In other words, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. In other words, by just giving you the first five pages, you thought they could collect everything in the world. And that's what the story was. But in fact, I mean, you could still have problems with that. This was still news because we'd never seen a FISA court order. But I think that if the New York Times had actually done that story, they would have also produced the 85 other pages. So, and in fact, those finally came out, I think, a month or so ago in a highly redacted fashion from the NSA. The reason I'm mentioning this is uh, because I think the story itself has had a lot of these kinds of problems, that you've only gotten half the story. And the way I've explained this is it's sort of like, do you remember John Hinckley? He was found innocent of shooting uh, President Reagan because he was insane. And if, in fact, he had perhaps just been told, you know, he was found innocent, how upset were people about that until they found out the underlying reason why he was found innocent? I feel like that is a, a real issue in this FISA court order as well. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about metadata, because I think there's confusion about what it is. Um, metadata is data about data. We know that. If you listen to the NSA, they will tell you that metadata is just like the outside of an envelope. I think you've heard uh, NSA Director uh, uh, Alexander say this a number of times. It's just the return address. Metadata is the to, from, and date on an email. It's not the contents. So it's the outside of an envelope. Return address, postmark gives you a date, where it was sent from, and an address of where it's going. This is pretty disingenuous of them. Because with what we can do now with computers, metadata gives you much more information than just what's on the outside of an envelope. So there's a program at MIT called Immersion. And what you do is you take all your emails and you give it to MIT. In my case, this is my NPR email account. This is about 34,000 emails, because I'm really bad at deleting. And it will set up a sort of network pattern of who it is that you're emailing and who's emailing you. What's really cool about this program is it does not include those emails you don't want, because it knows that you're not responding to that email. So they don't include junk email. They can write an algorithm that cuts out the junk email. So this is me, and these are my connections. And you will see there's a big blue dot in the middle. And I have sort of uh, masked a lot of this so that you do not find out too much about me. But my fiance is the big blue dot. His name is Harvey. And uh, around Harvey are some other people. And I won't read it all to you, but those people happen to be family members and uh, actually Gary King from uh, uh, Harvard. But basically, they're family members. And so that allows you to see kind of what my network is about. Who are the people I talk to? Who do they talk to? So let's get a little closer to this. This is, again, the immersion program. And this is something a little less personal than Harvey. Uh, these people in orange are Neiman Fellows with me. What you learn from this is that Flavia is probably my best friend of the Neiman Fellows, because she's got the biggest dot. You also, if you look, can see that there's kind of a dark gray line going down to Jasmine. Jasmine is Flavia's wife. And uh, Flavia, Rachel, and Susie and I do a lot of stuff together. And uh, clearly, we're not as close to Stephanie. And uh, we hardly talk to Anne. And Jasmine talked to her once, OK? Poor Anne. She's actually quite nice. But um, that sort of gives you a lot of information about me. So when you talk about uh, the NSA, you know, uh, President Obama has talked about the reforms that they're going to do in the NSA, right? And one of the things that he talked about is that they would go to two hops instead of three hops. 
So I thought this was a pretty good visual representation of what a hop means. So one hop from me would be Flavia. Two hops from me would be Flavia, Allison, and anybody that Anne is emailing. Three hops would be anybody Ellen is emailing. And you've heard about the, the Kevin Bacon game, right? Uh, six uh, levels of uh, separation from Kevin Bacon. I actually did Charlie Chaplin, thinking that one would at least get me up to a couple. Uh, it got me to two. That's how many movies Kevin Bacon has made. But this, if you go to six levels, six hops, you'd basically include everybody in the world. So going to two hops, which is one of the things that President Obama has suggested, is not actually as great as it sounds. Now, there's something else very interesting about this, and I think Flavia will excuse me for making this comparison, but if Flavia were a terrorist financier, I would learn an awful lot from her email traffic. I would know that, since I know this about Flavia, that there's a good chance that Susan and Rachel are helping her with that financing. I would know that Leslie and Allison, who often talks to Flavia, could have something to do with it too. And if I wanted to sort of wrap up this entire terrorist network, I know an awful lot of people who are involved. And I'd be curious about what Paul's up to. Why is Paul talking to these people only every once in a while? Could he be the real leader? And he only talks every once in a while to Ellie, who talks to Allison, who talks to Flavia, because he doesn't want to be caught as the chief financier. It tells you a lot about metadata. And it also tells you why the NSA is so interested in metadata. Um, and it also talks a little bit about how they might be um, a little disingenuous about how they use this information. So when we talk about tweaking the NSA, one of the things that President Obama has suggested is that they would also take this vast amount of information, and instead of having the government warehouse it or having the NSA warehouse it, they would actually have a third company warehouse it. And I don't have a really strong opinion about this, except that I think that it isn't quite understood what that actually means. Um, Google holds a lot of your information. Uh, when you click I accept without reading all that stuff that Google or Yahoo or AOL has actually asked you to accept about privacy or Facebook, nobody reads that stuff. That stuff basically says we can do anything we want with your information. So moving this to a third company doesn't really take care of the problem because in a way, the NSA has a lot more regulations borrowing its ability to use that information than Google does that would like to market to you. And you might be in the mood for a new car and Google can help you pick that car. So this is not necessarily a great solution. There, and reasonable people can disagree about this. Reasonable people could say, look, it just makes me nervous that the government has this much information. So I'd rather it go to a third party. But equally reasonable people could say, I don't particularly want a third party that isn't necessarily regulated very tightly with all my personal information. And this is the rub in the NSA tweaking that you're hearing about, that it's not an easy thing to do. And there's also this distinction that has been lost in the debate that has to do with what the NSA is really doing with this information. When it went to a FISA court, which by the way is staffed with federal judges that you all trust to do regular federal cases for you, this is not sort of some secret group. In fact, you can find their names all online. It's just their rulings that are classified. Uh, when you go to a federal judge and the FISA court makes a ruling, um, they just decided that all they would do is allow the NSA to hold the information. So they're warehousing. Now, that might make you nervous, but to actually analyze the information is another step. They have to ask permission to analyze it. So right now, it's in silos, and you might be nervous about that, but to go further and do, for example, what we did with metadata in looking at Flavia the terrorist, they need to get a warrant. Or they could get, and this is one of the gray areas, they could get a national security letter, which is kind of like a warrant after the fact, but it's still a warrant. And I think this has been lost in the debate as well. I think people think just because they're collecting 
that somehow they're analyzing too, and that's a distinct step. So I thought I would talk a little bit, I do like Pop-Tarts, but I thought I would talk a little bit about the cool uses of big data that have sort of been lost in this debate about the NSA. And Pop-Tarts are at the center of one of my favorite stories about big data. So it turns out that Walmart saves every single scintilla of information of all its customers. Uh, we know this a little better. This was a more original idea before Target and uh, Neiman Marcus and Michaels were hacked into. But at the same time, they save all this sales data. And so they asked their chief information officer and their techies there, well, run the data and, and try to see if there are patterns of buying that would make it more efficient for us to set up stores so that people will buy more. And they found out that there was actually a pattern of buying during, just in the run-up and during two hurricanes. So you can, this is uh, going to be interactive. What do you think the first thing most people buy is? I'll give you three. Bingo. What's the second thing? Nobody gets this one. Oh, that's good. Toilet paper's good. Batteries. Okay, a lot of people say batteries. In fact, it is the world's greatest invention, duct tape. And the third thing, I've already done it with the illustration, is strawberry Pop-Tarts. Uh, not some more, but in fact, strawberry. Okay, so I couldn't find just a strawberry illustration. Uh, this is my second PowerPoint. So basically, <laughs> strawberry Pop-Tarts. So then you start thinking, okay, if you're somebody who analyzes things, why strawberry Pop-Tarts? So you think, okay, it's raining and I actually know a lot about strawberry Pop-Tarts. They come two in a foil sealed bag. So if it's raining, they won't get wet. You do not necessarily need to cook them to make them good. You can eat them raw, as I do often. And they're kind of pleasing and sugary and nice. But then you think, well, geez, if I were really thinking, why wouldn't I get, if a hurricane is coming, and I don't know how long I'm gonna be without electricity, why wouldn't I get those little tiny cans of tuna that you can pop the top, pour the mayonnaise in, and eat the crackers, which are also sealed? And these are all really good questions. But Walmart doesn't care. What Walmart cares about is that when a hurricane is coming, its greeters go and set up a display that has water, duct tape, and strawberry Pop-Tarts so that you will buy them. So the interesting thing about is taking big data and applying it to terrorism, you actually care why a jihadi turns to violence. You actually care why people choose strawberry Pop-Tarts. And this is the problem that they're trying to figure out in the intelligence community when it comes to big data. So they're collecting all this information for the day when they can write an algorithm that explains to them why you bought the jihadi version of strawberry Pop-Tarts. Okay, so that's a good big data story. I'm gonna skip that and I'm gonna to go to my next good big data story. Manhole explosions, okay? These are called rare events because in New York, for example, they only happen between 50 and 100 times a year. This is one of the great big data success stories. Do you guys know this story? Excellent, okay. So the manhole uh, explosion story starts this way. I used to work for Mike Bloomberg. He's a real techie guy. He got this uh, sort of chief information officer for the city of New York, and he said, when manholes go up and blow up, they cause all kinds of problems. First of all, they're 250 pounds. So if they go up and your car is parked under it, you get a new car. It also creates uh, electrical blackouts. So if you have an electrical blackout, that costs money. And then there's, of course, the maintenance problem. So Bloomberg said, I'd like to see if there is a way to predict when manholes will blow. And it turns out that because New York has been around for a long time, it has over 100 years of manhole maintenance records. And uh, they're very interesting tickets because they're written like service box broken. So sometimes it's spelled service box, sometimes it's spelled S-R-V-B-X. Anyway, there are lots of different uh, combinations of this. The reason why I mention this is because that makes it something called unstructured data. So structured data looks kind of like your Excel spreadsheet. Very easy to search. Not very easy, but pretty easy to search structured data. 
Unstructured data, very hard to search. So all these professors at Columbia and some uh, uh, New York City officials got together and found a way to make all these crazy tickets sort of match. And then they ran, and that took a long time, and then they ran an algorithm and actually were able to rate manholes on their uh, susceptibility to blow. Yeah, cool. It's like the world's coolest thing. So, and in fact, they were like 90% correct, which is even cooler. And um, rare event data, one of the things that's the, uh, oh, I should say that now, uh, there's a, the woman who was sort of in charge of this, or one of the women in charge of this, now is at MIT. And I just happened to hear her speak at a big data conference at Harvard last week. And she said that the newest thing about this story is that, in fact, um, cities don't have a lot of money for maintenance now. So they're running the same algorithm to decide which manholes to maintain. The ones who have a high uh, probability of blowing are the first ones they fix. And the ones who have a low probability of blowing, they say, okay, we'll, we'll put that you know, when we have time. Fascinating and really nice use of big data. The reason why intelligence people look at stuff like these rare event data manhole events is because terrorism is a rare event. And the problem with trying to use big data to try to figure out when a terrorist attack is going to happen is that they happen so infrequently, you really don't have the information you need to figure out when it might happen. Manholes are the first sort of glimmer of how they might use this because they're technically rare events. I mean, the other problem is, too, if you actually take all this data and you find an algorithm and you might have some false positives, but it makes you 3% better at predicting a terrorist attack or finding a terrorist, is that worth the privacy that you give up? And I actually don't think that's that easy a question to answer. Someone asked me that and I immediately said, yes, of course, right, because 3% seemed enough to me. But maybe it's not. So that's a card shark, by the way. And the reason why he's there is because there's a man named Jeff Janos, who was the first person who did what's called non-obvious relationship awareness, called NORA. And it was a system for a casino that was looking to identify cheaters, like uh, groups of cheaters or card counters. And he concluded that he could zero in on card sharks um, by looking at an enormous amount of data. Uh, but he couldn't, f th but that kind of enormous data, because they have so sort of a pattern, but that kind of enormous data wouldn't work if you were looking for terrorists. He thinks that if the intelligence community has a specific person in mind, uh, big data and even smart data, which is what they're calling big data now, could help them find those people and their cohorts. Sort of like what we saw with Flavia the terrorist. But it can't identify terrorists out of thin air. Um, part of the problem that uh, public officials and uh, scientists are struggling with is this idea of how do you find a terrorist out of thin air. And the manholes are instructive in one way, right, because they're rare event data. But here's the big rub. Manholes don't decide whether or not to blow. They just do. And terrorists are human. And they can always decide at the last minute not to go through with what they were planning. This is one of the reasons now why suicide bombers are not trusted to blow themselves up alone. There's another switch. Somebody follows them and makes sure that they go through with the mission because they don't want them to suddenly change their mind at the last minute. So there are two remotes on every suicide vents. One that you do yourself if you're a good jihadi, and one that someone does to help you out if you're not such a good jihadi. So what I wanted to leave you with is sort of this idea that the, this is the age of big data and easy communication, and it's distributing power in a really different way than what we're used to. It's enabling dissidents, like the people in Egypt, to easily coordinate with each other. Uh, and these nimble organizations, like the, uh, the demonstrators in Egypt, are taking advantage of this much more quickly than these more traditional organizations like the NSA. 
But after a while, time works to NSA's advantage, or the intelligence community's advantage, or the Egyptian government's advantage. So it starts out with these nimble groups taking advantage of these new things, and then it ends up with governments and institutions really profiting from them. And that's what we're watching going on today. Um, it also magnifies the potential for damage. Five years ago, we didn't hear about millions of credit card numbers being stolen with a single hack, and now they can. And um, we need to try and figure out what the balance is here between this new technology and the rules that we have, and we haven't figured out that balance yet. And that is one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to be studying uh, at Harvard. I think the bear is falling in. What do you think? That's just a little tiny ice cube that he's uh, standing on. And I think that's what's going to end up happening, is that metaphorically, we're all going to have to sort of fall into this water and figure out and swim until we figure out what we think the balance should be, where privacy lines should be drawn, how much we are willing to give up to make sure that we're safe. And I'll tell you that for the most part, not just people in Michigan, but most people I've talked to, if you're in Washington or New York, you are outraged by this invasion of your privacy or this perceived invasion of your privacy. But in the real world, most people that I've talked to have said, I'm not doing anything wrong, and if this keeps me safer, then I'm fine with that. We need to have a bigger conversation about what that really means. Because I think, for example, when I showed you the map of metadata, I'm not entirely sure that you knew just the two from and date would allow that much information to go out. So the good thing about Edward Snowden is that he started a conversation going. I'm not entirely sure that we like the way the conversation started or the way it was started, but the conversation is one that we need to have. In the same way that uh, documents that were released about Guantanamo and that were released about torture and waterboarding made us think for a minute about what we as a country stand for and what we think is okay and what isn't. As far as we know now, the NSA has not broken any laws. They have stayed within the broad parameters of what the Patriot Act allows them to do. They have very good lawyers who have said to them, well, you know, if you look at this the right way and just say it's collection and it's not analysis, you are staying within the letter of the law. Maybe not the spirit, but certainly the letter of the law. Same thing happened with torture and indefinite detention. They were in the <clears throat> letter of the law, if not the spirit. And then we changed the law, and we no longer do torture, and we're trying to stop indefinite detention. And I think that is what is going to happen next. I think we're going to decide as a country how we feel those parameters should be drawn, and members of Congress will decide what they feel comfortable with, the people we vote for, and these laws will change. And that's what I'm going to be watching for you on NPR as soon as I get back. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. I can do anything. Okay, use that mic. Okay. Those of you that have some questions, please come down to the mics and uh, we'll get the question and answer period going. The uh, gentleman's already here, go ahead. One question and one comment. Do the doubting jihadis know of the second switch? They do now. <laughs> Because you just told them? Uh, no, I, I think that it's now known, but I think it was sort of a rude surprise to a lot of people when it started. Has that, has that had an effect on the, the uh, fr frequency? I mean, there's... No, as a general matter, the people who decide to be suicide bombers have some self-esteem issues anyway. Okay. So no, I don't know that it really matters. And my com comment is that I was amongst those folks that thought, I'm not doing anything wrong, I don't really care, until the third party was introduced. And in our society, that third party is probably a corporation. And that gives me great pause. Mm. Mm. And it's a good conversation to have. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm going to try to frame this in a way of really having, having some difficulty doing this. But I'm going to talk about it in terms of competitive advantage, the best, best way I can do this. How does the US and the Western world stand compared to second and third world countries in terms of its ability to not only gather, but to analyze and uh, understand the data that is being gathered. 
<coughs> we're pretty good at it. We're pretty good at it, I think. I think there's a lot of stuff we don't know they're doing about that that, that that keeps us safe. I mean, I think it's sort of interesting that they figured that the NSA and the intelligence community was sort of working on these things years ago to try, they figured the technology was gonna go there. And, and what is it, like Wayne Gretzky says, you go to where the puck's gonna be, not where the puck is. I think they're good at that. Do I think that the Chinese and the Russians are amazing hackers? Yes. Do they give the US run for their money? Absolutely. Do I think that the Chinese are trying, it's a little bit different. And I know Snowden said recently that the US uses uh, its ability to listen to people as uh, you know, in an economic sense. I've never heard that before, and he didn't really prove that. He just said it. The difference is that Russia and China actually steal blueprints from corporations. Mm. <clears throat> and that's just different. The US is doing it theoretically, for what we know so far, to keep us safe. Uh, hackers from around the world are stealing credit cards and uh, corporate secrets so that they don't have to do research. And it's costing the United States billions and billions of dollars. Thank Good you. question. Gentleman over here on this mic. I was wondering if you know how the locution uh, Arab Spring came about and whether you think that it's a, a good idea. Well, I, the word spring <clears throat> happens every time someone has a demonstration. I was in, uh, I was in Beijing during the Tiananmen Square um, demonstrations, then later the crackdown. I was a baby journalist working for the Chinese government at the time. And uh, we call that Beijing Spring. So I think it's just sort of the shorthand that everybody uses. Actually, not everybody. The media uses, and then everybody sort of grabs it. But unfortunately, Spring kind of turned into something else, particularly in Egypt. So um, I, I, I think now the sort of term kind of is Arab awakening or something. But it's, it's a shorthand so that they can put it, you know, that, that bug at the bottom of a screen on TV is called a Chiron. It's a shorthand for a Chiron. And I don't love that term. I've probably used it, but I don't love it. Yes, sir. I wonder if you could comment on the fact that it seems like our security agencies, uh, FBI, NSA, CIA, <clears throat> are very slow to learn how to prevent leaks. I mean, we can go back to the Pentagon Papers. It was much easier when you had a stack of papers right. to just walk them out in a briefcase. We have digital data right now, and they seem very slow and reluctant to put in systems to prevent what Snowden did. Second question, if you could comment. Snowden's released a lot of documents. How do we know what he's releasing is actually accurate? There's no way to confirm those documents, is there? No, that's, I'll take the second one first, and then if I forget the first one, don't go away, and then you can ask again. <laughs> Small yeah, mind. Uh, that is part of the rub in in, in covering the Snowden documents and why I'm really happy I'm at Harvard not having to cover them and everybody else at NPR is having to cover them because um, frankly, the, the, the classified data, when it's classified, no one's allowed to confirm it. So even the WikiLeaks documents, someone who has a security clearance isn't allowed to look at them or confirm them. So you know more about the WikiLeaks documents than, the intelligence, than an agent in the intelligence community is allowed to know unless he's reading it in the newspaper. He's not allowed to go onto, <clears throat> excuse me, the WikiLeaks site and look and see what's there. So as a reporter, if they put the documents up, there are certain things that you look for in documents, numbers and things like that, that give you an idea that it's legit. But they, put the, they have put a lot of these documents up in a very selective way. Not just the 85 pages they didn't use, but sometimes slides you know, that they put up as being part of a presentation, the slides aren't from the same presentation. And you can find little clues about dates being different and things. So it's made it very hard to cover because you don't know if it's true. And it's a little easier to cover now that The Guardian isn't the only newspaper that's covering it. It's an advocacy newspaper in the UK. It's a great newspaper, but it has a point of view. It's sort of like using Fox News as your only piece of information. The Guardian's the other side. It's a, a sort of a liberal paper. Now that the New York Times has got the documents and the Washington Post has a lot of the documents, you're getting stories that are much more balanced that sort of explain what the, how the programs really work. And now they're actually going to people and having conversations with people within these organizations saying, this is what we're going to publish. We're going to give you an opportunity to put it in context. Frankly, that's what we did with the Guantanamo Papers. 
So we knew what we wanted to publish. We went through all the papers. We had all our stories ready. There was another news organization, the New York Times, that also had the tranche of papers. And we got on the phone. This is actually a really cool process. You get on the phone with Pentagon people and say, this is what we're going to do. And they say, we don't want you to publish anything because it's all classified. We go, OK, fine. You've said that. This is what we're going to do. Now tell us why we can't do it. And there was actually one story that we did not do because they convinced us it would get somebody killed. And the New York Times didn't do it either. And that information is on the web, on the WikiLeaks site, and nobody's found it. Uh, and that's highly interesting to me. And it also says what's wrong about WikiLeaks, in my opinion, is that I don't think pure transparency is a great idea. I think you can get people killed. And so we're, we're a lot more responsible about these things as journalists, as a general matter, than people think. And that if they make a good case that we shouldn't publish something, we don't. And your first question was about um, uh, leaks. Uh, naturally, as a journalist, I am not adverse to leaks. <laughs> um, if they're given to a particular radio station in particular, um, a lot of, uh, look, the, the Snowden stuff is interesting because Snowden went to one of the few places, uh, satellite offices of the NSA that didn't have the need for two identifiers to allow you to get in as an administrator. Did he know that ahead of time? I don't know. Did he discover it and then sort of figure out what he was going to do in downloading? Maybe. I don't know. Um, but as a general matter, classified information usually comes out by accident. Okay, I've gotten a piece of classified information before. And I thought that the way it happened was that someone put something in a manila envelope and slid it across the table to you. That was my concept of how you got classified information. <coughs> The piece of classified information that I got about a year ago, maybe, was that there were 17 active investigations in the military by the FBI of jihadis who had infiltrated the military. The reason why this is important is because the worst terrorist attack we've had in this country since 9-11 was Fort Hood. So if you have some real live scary jihadis in the military, embedded in the military, these are people you want to investigate. So this was told to me in the context of a really long conversation over lunch. And it was an off-the-record conversation where we were just talking amongst each other to try to compare notes on various things. And so I got back to the office, and I suddenly thought, wow, I don't think that 17 number is out there, that there are 17 active investigations. Hmm. So I called this person back. And I said, is that 17 number out there that we know that there's 17 active investigations or formal investigations? And he said, no, you know what? That might be classified. And I said, ah, OK. Well, um, I'd love to use it. Um, would you mind if maybe I went to go and get it somewhere else so no one would know that you accidentally told me this? I could get it, mm, I don't know, on Capitol Hill, where it, would, where it leaks like a sieve. And I'm pretty sure that I could cover your tracks and nobody would know that you gave this to me accidentally. But if this makes you nervous, I won't do it. And this person said, OK, I trust you. So I called up the Hill, and Joseph Lieberman was, maybe I shouldn't say this. Hmm. Anyway, he was about to leave the, uh, the Senate. And one of his big, big issues was jihadis in the military. So I called his office and I said, look, I know the 17 number is true. I'm doing the story. I know Senator Lieberman is leaving the Senate. And I'm sure he would like to be in a very big story about how this is a problem in the military. And she said, we're not going to confirm the 17 number. And I said, OK, fine. I said, I know it's true. I don't need you to confirm it. I said, but does he want to be in this piece? And she said, maybe 15 or 16 times. We're not going to, maybe 17 times. We're not going to confirm the 17 number. <laughs> And I said, that's fine. So eventually, Joseph Lieberman was in the piece, along with some other people. Uh, I called the FBI, and I said, look, I'm going to do this story about these 17 open FBI investigations. And they said, we're not going to confirm the number. I said, I don't want you to. I know it's true. The idea is, if you are about to move on one of these cases and arrest someone, and if I come out with a story and it ruins that case for you, I'm willing to wait with the story. My editor said, I can wait. We want to be responsible. 
So I went up the chain of command, the FDI came back down, and they said, well, we're not about to move on anyone, but we still don't want you to do the story. And I said, I'm sorry, you don't want me to do the story. It'll be out on Friday on Morning Edition. And um, the story was quite a sensation. Nobody else could match it. And the fact that Lieberman was in the story, he would never be in a story that wasn't true. So implicitly, he was confirming that it was 17 cases. It was a really huge story. Um, that kind of leak seems okay to me. Uh, the other kinds of leaks, I think there's a responsibility involved. And I think there are things that the New York Times, for example, has seen in Snowden documents, that is and they have decided that um, it's not responsible to publish some of those things. And I think that happens all the time. And this is a new age in which you can download several servers on a thumb drive now. And that's what it looks like Snowden did. So in terms of being able to prevent leaks, it's harder now than ever. And to keep secrets, harder now than ever. And to be able to confirm that something that you get is real, in my case, harder now than ever. It's all personal relationships. That's what it ends up being. The person who gave you that piece of information or that paper is somebody that you have a long-standing relationship with and that you trust them. Okay. One more question here. <clears throat> Yes, hi. You mentioned the um, interview of the NSA director on television. And I happened to see that. I think he was the director. Um, but I happened to see that. And, and I got this, the weirdest feeling. Everything, if I put on my citizen hat, everything he said in there seemed reasonable. But if I put on my computer expert hat, he was like lying, lying, flat out wrong, mm -hmm. lying. and. I was wondering, like, how can this guy be making statements that are both true and not true at the same time? Are Is you talking about James Clapper, the DNI director, or are you talking about Alexander, the NSA director? Was this on 60 Minutes? NSA director, 60 Minutes. Okay, yeah, well, that was sort of a weird story. But uh, um, I think the better way to answer that would be that the new NSA director and head of Cyber Command, Mike Rogers, not related to your congressman, um, knows how to write an algorithm. So he understands, and Alexander doesn't. So he understands this in a really, he's a cryptologist. He understands this in a really fundamental way. How that will change things, I'm not entirely sure, but it gets to the crux of your question is, you know, how much do they know? There's also this question about FISA court judges when they're asked about the, these NSA programs. These are very, solid citizens. These are men we trust to make decisions on many, many other legal things in our lives. These are not techies. So when they are asked to make these decisions about NSA programs, they don't understand what's possible or not. It's not their fault. They just don't understand. And I think this is part of the problem, too. But uh, I, think, I think the new NSA director is going to be um, highly interesting, is what I would say. Okay, uh, great question. Thank you for coming. And, uh, we got one more question. Oh, sorry. One, oh, I'm sorry. One more question right up here sorry. on the right. Hi, in, in the area of... Uh, this is the man from the shadows. We can't quite see him. <laughs> in the area of uh, using big data to try and anticipate or prevent um, some sort of terrorist action, it seems to me that if you have knowledge out there in the world about the action of people watching big data to try and look for that, if there's knowledge and awareness of any kind of algorithms that are being used to track it, they'd be very susceptible to being spoofed, to being fooled, to being flooded with false positive information. Is that something that you guys also study, the potential for that? Um. I think this gets to the question, actually, of, of, of damage that might have been done by the Snowden documents, which is sort of what you're getting at. And um, it's hard to prove a negative, but I, I'll give you one example. That for a really long time, former FBI director Robert Mueller said that he was very frustrated because the FBI could not listen to Skype phone calls. He testified to this on the Hill. He would talk about it all the time, how they needed this technology. So terrorists talk to each other a lot on Skype. 
In fact, the US was listening to all their Skype phone calls. The terrorists didn't know. Terrorists are no longer using Skype. Mm. So that gives you an idea. OK. OK. Um, Dana, thank you very much for an amazing program. Thank you. You've kicked off a great series. I'd like to invite all of you to join us next week. Cleo Pasco, a fellow of Great Britain's premier foreign policy think tank, Chatham House, will talk with us about how the three geos, geopolitics, geophysics, and geoeconomics are changing the world. So our meeting's adjourned. Please remember that if you're not a member, stop by one of the tables and pick up a membership. And thank you for coming, and see you next week. <laughs>